Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Jabez, and thank you for sticking with us. I am so, so happy to be back in conversation with Lajene McMillian. Um, and before we get started, I just wanted to just really honor the work that you're doing. Um, and I think, cause I'm gonna gash you up in a second anyway, and be like, wow, I think you're so amazing. But just the work that you're doing is so powerful. We were connected, uh, we were in conversation with each other um, with a conversation via uh, Birmingham Media and um, Open Media and really introduced me to your work and your practice. And our conversation was so fulfilling and so inspiring. And the work that you do is just incredible. So I'm gonna read your bio just to make you cringe a little bit. <laughs> um, Lajene is a new media artist and creative technologist, creating art that integrates performance, virtual reality and physical computing to question our current forms of communication. Lajene has had the opportunity to show and speak about their work at Pioneer Works, National Sawdust, Leaders in Software and Art, Creative Tech Week, and Art and Code's Weird Reality, just to name a few, you know. Lajene was, was previously the director of skating at Figure State Skating in Harlem, which can I just say is like, what? And also, <laughs> because you know, we follow, we follow each other on Instagram now, but when I was looking at, Listen, Lajene posted some stuff on Instagram, right? Go follow Lajene on Instagram is all I'm going to say. Figure skating, it makes me want to do it and I'm afraid of falling on my butt. So, you know, hold tight you, Lajene. <laughs> Let me get back to your bio. <laughs> the director of skating at Figure Skating in Harlem, where they integrated steam and figure skating to teach girls of color about movement and technology. They have continued their research on blackness, movement and technology during residencies at iBeam, Pioneer Works, Barbarian Group, and Barnard College. Lajene, how you feeling, honey? Good. Thanks so much for having me. Um, oh. Yeah, thank yeah, <laughs> thank you for the introduction. I'm um, so excited to be here today um, and to speak to you all. Um, and I guess I'll just jump into the slides because I can um, show you a little bit more about my work. Um, so yeah, I actually like just changed the name of the Black Movement Project to Black Movement Library. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, just a little bit about me. Um, yes, I'm a new media artist and I started this work while I was in school um, at NYU Tandon's um, School of Engineering. Um, I first started there as a mechanical engineering major, but then really <laughs> quickly just like switched my major because I was like, this is not for me. So um, I just switched it to digital media and not really knowing like what that was. Um, I was just like amazed at all of these different things that you could do with technology, um, especially like how you could integrate it into performance and into installation art. So um, yeah, I began a, a journey into the art uh, uh, tech world um, while I was there. Um, however, when I left school, I realized that my access to a lot of these different tools and technologies like depleted really quickly. So the really expensive computers that I used um, the, and the really uh, great um, uh, motion capture technologies that I used like were no longer at my fingertips. And um, it really made me question and, and really made, and really made me wonder like what I could do um, to make sure that this um, isn't necessarily something that um, continues in the world. Um, and so, yeah, I began really thinking about what it means to have access to different digital technologies, um, especially ones to create extended reality projects. And in the past few years, access to motion capture data and 3D um, character-based models and software um, to make animation yourself has skyrocketed from Make Human to Mixamo to Carnegie Mellon's motion capture database. The ability to make and finish polished projects has become easier for many. And while these resources are extremely helpful to create a range of projects, they lack tools that create diverse characters and movements unexplored by systems that center assumptions of neutrality. And so I decided that I was going to start the Black Movement Project um, to combat that. And it started as, well, now it's Black Movement Library, but um, it started as an online database of Black motion capture data and Black character-based models. So I was like, OK, like, we don't have any like representation in these spaces. Let me create that, create that representation. But then I realized quickly um, afterwards that representation is not, real, is not enough 
um, to really, uh, I really wanted to dive to the root of a lot of these issues. And we first need to understand how our movements and bodies are already represented in the media and in the tools that we use. And so um, I began learning about digital blackface and seeing it all over um, social media. And if you've never heard, and this is actually from, we need to talk about digital blackface and I'll just read out the quote. But if you've never heard of the term before, digital blackface is used to describe various types of menstrual performance that become available in cyberspace. Blackface minstrelsy is a theatrical tradition dating back to the early 19th century in which performers blackened themselves up with costume and behaviors to act as black caricatures. The performances put society's most racist sensibilities on display and in turn fed them back to audiences to intensify these, fe these feelings and disperse them across culture. Many of our most beloved entertainment genres owe at least part of themselves to the minstrel stage, including vaudeville, film, and cartoons. While often associated with Jim Crow era racism, the tenets of minstrel performance remain alive today in television, movies, music, and in its most advanced iteration on the internet. And so, enough, so basically, uh, how I got to um, digital blackface uh, before I started creating this. Uh, um, library was um, actually through these lawsuits in 2018. So when I first started creating this space um, was in 2018 and uh, also alongside these lawsuits that were filed against Fortnite. And um, essentially Fortnite is a video game um, that's created by Epic Games, which actually um, has created Unreal Engine, which is what I use to create a lot of different visuals for my art. Um, however, um, there were lawsuits that were filed against them for using dances from mainly black, black creators without permission, compensation, or credit. Um, the Millie Rock became the Swipe It, the Carlton became the Fresh, and it effectively erased the origins of these dances. Um, currently, these lawsuits are, are a pause because the dances are not considered choreography under copyright law. So for me, this lawsuit added an entirely new layer to um, the, uh, the project in the library because I realized that we, we are living in a world that just has this sort of like lack of care and this lack of protection um, for Black people. And so how do we address that? And um, in other instances of like digital Blackface um, are like uh, when non-Black folks use um, memes of Black people, uh, memes and gifts of Black people on Twitter, um, and also in its most recent iteration on TikTok, where mainly white creators um, have been stealing um, entire dance routines um, from Black creators on the same um, platform. And um, in turn, they get millions of views, whereas Black creators get maybe um, thousands of views. Um, and yeah, it's like they get promotions, they get um, all different types of, of just like of money and, uh, and resources to continue doing this. And it's like, okay, like how do we stop this, uh, stop this re from reoccurring um, on more and different platforms? And um, so yeah, so those are um, examples in social media, but. Um, on the flip side, in digital softwares and tools that are accessible um, for um, people to use, um, when you're looking for culturally specific movements um, in existing motion capture databases, you may find some, but you are often met with dances and movements that don't reflect the search terms. And also in the name of making it easy to use, these tools often omit valuable information from the users, including information about the motion capture actor who, pro who provided the movements and the historical and cultural information about the movements performed. So um, in this gift behind um, the words, essentially um, you see one of the characters that I created um, doing a dance that is named hip hop dancing. And um, essentially, uh, it's really weird because like this is this dance is clearly not hip hop dancing or like I don't know like if <laughs> if I like saw hip hop dancing like I would not associate it with this movement um, and also hip hop dance hip hop has like so many different variations of movement so um, to limit it to um, just like all of these uh, random movements 
is sort of odd. Um, and also it's careless. Um, and in another example, this is a uh, character creation software that I use um, called FaceGen, which actually works really well um, by taking your pictures of yourself um, and compiling them into a 3D, um, 3D representation of yourself to create avatars. Um, so yeah, basically it takes a front facing and a profile facing pro photo. And then from there, it turns you into um, an avatar. So what it works for, is, it works well. However, we see that this tool becomes extremely problematic um, with its use of these really problematic so, uh, sliders that you can see at the bottom. So we see here um, that they have a slider for African, a slider for East Asian, South Asian, and the last one says European. And um, what this really shows us is that um, the software developers that created this software um, basically uh, decided that um, various <laughs> ways of looking can be um, diluted down to um, a slider. Um, it makes me question exactly where they got the information to put this into this character creation software. You know, where are they getting this um, quote unquote data to inform them on their decisions? Um, and also, uh, like, <laughs> why are they doing this? And um, another thing is you can also see um, software developers' um, ideas about gender and how um, gender is, a, a, is a connected to skin tone. So when the slider goes to a darker skin tone, um, the gender of that character becomes more quote unquote male. And when the character becomes lighter skin, they become more quote unquote female. And so um, this, this, is, this is not necessarily, this doesn't necessarily like surprise me because um, you know, I feel like we can see a lot of like how um, we are seen and how people are seen in society how people are categorized in society within a lot of these different softwares and tools. Um, but what does it mean to use these softwares? Um, because I still use them, um, but through a critical lens. So um, the common thread of all of these examples um, is the oversimplification of Black people, our stories, and our lives. And this is operating in a network of systems that quantify and degrade our humanity in order to capitalize off of our existence and being. So what does it mean to combat the ex exploitation, erasure, and dilution of Black culture and Black people? And what do cultural reparations look like? You know, um, reparations in general, just for all of this theft, for all of this um, degradation, and uh, for all of these wrongdoings. And so I just want to say that Black movement does not only represent our individual experiences, but it also represents our collective memory, transcending space, time, and white supremacist social structures. It allows us to connect to each other, our ancestors, our deepest, our deepest selves, and gives us a space to communicate to our future. Black movement is a technology holding the stories of our existence across the diaspora. And our bodies and movements are more than data points and avatars. They hold our humanity. And so it's time for digital spaces and all spaces that we enter to reflect that. So what does it mean to ethically digitize um, our movement and how can it better serve and celebrate the community? How can we effectively challenge digital tools and landscapes that don't share these values and gain liberation in our collective future? So um, I began doing a lot of uh, just like research into um, decon like de decolonial, decolonial thought and, um, and what it means to decolonize technologies and digital tools. And this is from um, Decolonizing Artificial Intelligence. And I'll just read out this, um, this quote, decolonization emphasizes self-ownership for land and peoples and nations. It emphasizes the restoration of land and life to its original inheritors. Self-ownership, as Fanon says, is a precondition for the creation of new forms of life. To create new ways of living and being, we need self-ownership. For knowledge and decolonization, for knowledge, decolonization um, emphasizes the restoration of self-confidence. 
We need self-confidence to create thought and ways of thinking. There are three views of decolonization that give me a more concrete understanding. As decentering, as a decentering of European knowledge, one can remove the colonial power back, back to England or to France, but their legacies of thinking, psychology, economics, and culture remain. Decolonization asks us to remove Europe or the West more generally as a point of reference. We should reject the imitation of the West in our scientific work. We should assert our own identities. We should recenter our knowledge. As on, appro on approaches that uh, restore our global histories and problems and solutions. For Gugi Wationgo, this meant rejecting the English language as an unassailable medi medium of teaching and discourse. For we technologists, this could be the recentering of our motivations, not always on the problems of Silicon Valley, but on our own localities and questions and backgrounds. And um, from there, in Black performance theory, Dr. Nadine George Graves defines diasporic spot spidering as the multidirectional process by which African, by which people of African descent define their lives, the lifelong ontological gathering of information by going out into the world and coming back to the self. And she does this by drawing connect connections to the evolving folklore of Anansi to how Google and other search engines use web crawlers to find and organize new information and grow for their growing databases. So essentially, what does it mean to take this idea of diasporic spidering um, as a way to decolonize digital tools and digital technologies? This is uh, pretty much like the centering of uh, the work that I'm doing. So yeah, Black Movement Library is a library for activists, performers, and artists to create diverse extended reality projects, a space to research how and why we move, and an archive of our existence. And um, this library seeks to grow a community through performances, um, extended reality experiences, workshops, conversations, and tool making. And yeah, the library incorporates a narrative component to be seen as a live performance in VR docu-series showing how Black movement has been used as a tool of as been used as a tool of the preservation of Black culture as well as a vehicle of self-evolution. And um, essentially, I uh, began working with different Black performance artists. Um, the first two artists that I worked with. Um, were Nala Duma and Ronaldo Maurice. And Nala Duma is a music producer, but grew up moving and dancing. Um, and Ronaldo Maurice is, uh, is another performer and dancer who also dances with Alvin Ailey. And so essentially I worked with them um, over like the course of four months and they wore these perception neuron suits, which are standalone motion capture suits. And uh, essentially, these motion capture suits uh, allow uh, motion data, their motions, their movements to get translated um, into um, movement and then into visuals in real time. And the first, and, um, and yeah, so, and so basically the first way that uh, this was seen was as a performance. It was a live performance where they both um, essentially wore the suits and I live uh, VJ'd uh, their movements um, through projection. And essentially they both performed to their, to these interviews that I did with them. And uh, I was just asking them a lot of questions about their movement journeys. Um, you know, what were their, like, what are their backgrounds and what is their, um, what, what has been like their, journey through um, not only just like moving as in dancing and performing, but also just like their journeys through life. And I really wanted to create a piece where people and audiences were invited to meet uh, the movers themselves. And also this was um, a live archived um, experience too. So sort of seeing like what it means to bring people together to see um, uh, a, a movements get archived while in the live performance itself. And so, and then from there, I uh, translated them, translated the movements that they created um, into movement portraits. So the movement portraits are acting as these 2D and VR representations of the live performance. And I'll show you this in a second. 
but the translation into a port into a portrait allows the movement allows the movement to be a re-representation of an abstract digital memory of the performance. And so over the course of the year, I was sitting with the data that I had uh, that I captured of them while they were um, while they were moving. And essentially I was like listening to their interviews and re reimagining the vi the visuals. And so um, I was reconstructing and diving into this visual process as its own ritual and asking like, how do we translate digital representations of self and others? And now I just want to show you um, both the live performance and then um, a three minute version of Bala's um, movement portrait. And then here's um, the movement portrait, which has um, a lot of similarities from the visuals from the live performance, but um, I did a lot of like work on them too. And this is also Nala's. Go around. 
Yeah, so that's actually just like a snippet. This is actually a 10, uh, an 11 minute long um, animation. Um, but I, and, and I'll um, send, well, I, I think I can send a link to that, um, but after, <laughs> afterwards. Um, but yeah, the last project that I wanted to talk about is um, the work that I just worked on now called Antidote. And I just collaborated on this project. I was, we were really thinking about like what it means to continue this work now during um, a time where we don't have um, really like access to being together um, in, in um, physical space um, on this plane of existence. So um, I was uh, so grateful to be able to collaborate with Marguerite Hemmings, who is a collaborator and a, an amazing just like mastermind. And essentially we um, came together to um, really try to understand what it means to um, be in um, be in community with one another like while we can't be physically um, together. So I just want to read out this um, this quote. Antidote is an offering in a prayer. It's an interruption, in a hacking, a portal, a medicine, a ritual response and physical undoing of the lie that we are not our own and that we are not free. And yeah, essentially over, um, I wanna say like two months, we met over Zoom and um, Pioneer Works uh, actually sent her um, a motion capture suit and I had my own motion capture suit and we um, did this work as a commission for Abrams Art Center. And it was first supposed to be a workshop, but um, it actually just, it, it, it became um, an animation work in its own self. And um, essentially we would take the Zoom sessions um, with, the, with the motion capture suit on and we would um, do a lot of different witnessing activities um, witnessing our, uh, our movements. Um, we would call in our ancestors to the space um, and we would essentially open portals to be together with one another. And so while we were doing this work, um, we ended up getting connected with Salome Asega, who is a creative technologist. And she saw just like a few um, different um, visuals of the work and she said, hey, like, it's really important that you, um, that as you are working on this piece and making this piece and opening these portals of connection, and as you share this with people, that you also um, find ways to protect that space and also acknowledge your ancestors who um, have, who have, who are the, who are the real um, inheritors and, and the true, um, um, I guess like stewards of the land. So she told us that we needed to um, basically craft a, a digital land acknowledgement for the piece. And so from there we got um, connected to Amber Starks who is an Afro indigenous activist. And together we all crafted a digital land acknowledgement but, but they both um, wrote like we, Essentially, Marguerite and I were talking to Salome and Amber about like what it is that we're trying to like say in this space. And they took those conversations and crafted these beautiful land acknowledgements. Um, and it was just like such a mind blowing experience to be a part of um, because to place that into an animated work, what I realized was that um, it, it allowed me to ground the work but it also um, was holding me accountable um, to the work itself too, to make sure that if I'm bringing um, ancestors into the space, that I need to really respect them um, in, the, in the following animations or in the following work that we produce. And it sort of just like left me mind blown. So I wanted to show you, and then also we got uh, connected to Rina Anakwe, who is an amazing artist and um, also just like so, such a talented sound artist who <laughs> took this work and created an amazing um, soundscape for it. So I just wanted to show um, a, uh, I wanted to show like the first part. I wanted to show Amber Starts um, part of the land acknowledgement and then I'll just like move on. So, yeah. 
Antidote is our inheritance. It is a place of refuge in a very anti-Black world. It is a place that will forever transcend space and time, white supremacy, settler colonialism, and racial capitalism. It is a place of freedom, a maroon space, the great dismal swamp, free towns, the place where our ancestors found liberation in one another, indigenous peoples of this land, and the natural world. Antidote advises us, oppressed and marginalized peoples, to continue to invest in our own liberation. It is a reminder that our ancestors held firm to this fundamental idea that we deserve to exist outside of oppression. And it is because our ancestors truly believed in and rooted themselves in this notion that we are still here today. So as we move through this infinite space today and every day, let us first remember the ones who came before us. We must acknowledge that antidote would not be fully realized without indigenous peoples of Turtle Island and without stolen indigenous peoples of Africa. To the indigenous peoples of these lands, you are the true stewards and rightful heirs of these territories. We call out your names to acknowledge your sovereignty and bestow respect on your ancestors and your descendants. The Lenape, the Kalapuya, the Kaolits, the Klatskanai, the Atfalati, the Nachkochchank, the Pitskatawe, the Munsi, and the Karnisi. To you, we say, we see you. You are not forgotten. You are still here. We remember that your peoples, along with other indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, endured under contact European imperialism, attempted genocide, smallpox blankets, land theft, forced removal, broken treaties, warfare, desecrated sacred sites, boarding schools, stolen generations, forced assimilation, allotment, blood quantum, reservations, urbanization, cultural suppression, severed relationships to the natural world, and denial of your sovereignty and right to self-governance. We have an understanding that our feet could not have landed on solid ground without your sacrifice and without your grave loss. Your names shall always be on the tips of our tongues and rooted in the sacred spaces of our hearts. And to Black, indigenous peoples of Africa, and all of their descendants. Antidote would not prevail without you, the stolen ones, the ones who endured the slave castles on the shores of West Africa, the middle passage, the auction blocks, enslavement, commodification, dehumanization, Jim Crow, segregation, state-sponsored terrorism, black codes, sundown laws, the one drop rule, redlining, ghettos, the war on drugs, the prison industrial complex, and global anti-blackness. We say your names without knowing them. We think thoughts of you without ever seeing you. We honor your humanity and we hold accountable these systems that have sought to commodify and destroy you. Those of us who are your legacy live as a testament to your endurance and your will to survive the horrors we can only imagine. We remember your determination and we celebrate your tenacity. You are also rooted in the sacred spaces in our hearts and will not be forgotten. Yeah, so that's a way longer piece, um, but I can send uh, the length of that also <laughs> after this. Um, but yeah, the last thing that I wanted to talk about today um, was essentially like a uh, workshop, <laughs> workshop work. Um, what this like, okay, so I had like a huge, just like awakening moment after like completing working on Antidote. Um, I was just like, uh, wow. Um, and it really actually even transformed like the workshop experience um, <laughs> that I uh, started um, and it started as Understanding, Transforming, and Preserving Movement in Digital Spaces, a workshop um, to learn about extended reality tools and relationships to race, gender, and culture. Um, the workshop um, explores is issues of cultural representation and exploitation through readings, discussions, 
and provides this introduction to all of these different digital tools. So um, this has been a traveling workshop that I've um, given at various different spaces. But um, what Antidote taught me was that um, it was missing a very, very important piece um, that, uh, oh yeah, and also like now that I'm doing it online, um, I'm using um, Deep Motion, and if y'all are interested in getting into motion capture, um, y'all can go there and just like upload videos yourself. That was just like a, a side point. But um, what I realized was that I was missing a really, really important part um, in this workshop, which is that um, it needs to include our bodies as um, technologies, and we need to find ways to reestablish our connections to our embodied technologies while we're also learning about these digital technologies in this space. So in this workshop, we dive into frameworks that I've been investigating, researching, and developing with others. Um, we go out into the world. So we use this di diasporic spidering um, by working with um, di different digital technologies and tools, understanding how they, how they work and um, what they get wrong. But then we come back to the self by discovering and diving into and developing our embodied technologies. And so um, now I'm asking students to enter the space with, um, with their whole selves and to spend time to witness another sort of go on this journey. Um, and can this intersection of different fields um, help us to unravel and understand our how our humanity weaves through um, the recordings of our movements, the modeling of our bodies and the 3D realizations of the worlds, we, of the worlds in which we live in the world which, that we wish to be in. And um, I also am asking students to hack the traditional ways in which we learn and engage with digital tools by embedding our whole selves into the process. Um, so this workshop depends on its sensors process and what new portals of connection can we discover together. And yeah, I was really also just inspired by James Baldwin's, um, uh, James Baldwin, just like his, all of his thoughts on witnessing and what it means to witness. And um, this is from um, the New, a New York Times article called um, Reflections, of Ma uh, Reflections of a Maverick um, and um, in conversation with um, Julius Lester. And I'll just read this out real quick. But you've been politically engaged, but you've never succumbed to the ideology which has devoured some of the best black writers of my generation. Um, and he replies, perhaps I didn't succumb to this ideology, as you put it, because I have never seen myself as a spokesman. Um, I am a witness. In the church in which I was raised, you were supposed to bear witness to the truth. Now, later on, you wonder what in the world the truth is, but you do know what a lie is. And so what is the difference between a spokesman and a witness? The spokesman assumes that he is speaking for others. I never assumed that. I never assumed that I could. Fannie Lou Hammer, for example, could speak very eloquently for herself. What I tried to do or to interpret or and make clear was that the Republic was doing to that woman, that what the Republic was doing to that woman, it was also doing to itself. No society can smash the social, the social contract and be exempt from its consequences. And the consequences are chaos for everybody in the society. And so, yeah, I, I I began thinking about how does this, how can this act of witnessing be applied to digital technologies and digital tools? How can we transition from motion capture to motion witnessing? I've been thinking a lot about just the, the history or the etymology of the word capture and how we use it in all of these different uh, digital tools that we use. Um, and what does it mean to sort of strip that word from these tools? Um, and in that case, um, I guess like we colonize them as we um, work with them. And yeah, last is just like conversations. And this is a, this should be a conversation, but I'm talking so much, so I'm gonna stop. But uh, yeah, uh, this is a movement um, that celebrates our history and our culture, and that holds us accountable to the ways in which we deal um, with one another, our movements, our bodies, and our lives. Thank you. Uh, uh, and that's my <laughs> that's my information. Okay. My heart, <laughs> my heart is tripping. Like it's going double time right now because I'm so, I'm so excited. Your work is just mind blowing. 
Look at all the emojis that you gave. <laughs> Love an emoji. Um, I mean, you, you, you've you talked about so much and I would really encourage anyone to um, feel free to turn your mic off or to pop anything in the chat and just, you know, be in conversation with us as well. Um, but I'm really fascinated by the way in which language plays such a such an important role in your own practice. And, you know, even this this idea from like motion capture to motion witnessing and and the etymology of like capture and what that means and generating new meaning and decolonizing language and how you you apply that and experiment that through technology is just like blowing my mind like motion witnessing and then when you say it, it's like of course yes and also any opportunity to bring in James Bolden it's like <laughs> yes but you know that you make it these things seem like so matter of fact but your brain is incredible to be able to to do that so I just kind of want to honor you a little bit and just celebrate your brain and you <laughs> something that's so powerful about um digital land acknowledgement like as a concept, I think what was really important with, um, you know, thinking about the spatial imagination and everything that comes with space, like all the different types of spaces. And what we're talking about here with you is, yes, a virtual space and this comes with it. You know, th this, is how, this is what we're talking about when we talk about virtual space or digital space. This is how movement within black people is exploited. This is how, there's something about this, um, this imagination of black people that you created infrastructures for. You know, there's a way in which I think I wrote down, you know, the black movement library as an infrastructure in and of itself is so powerful. We're talking about imagination lots, but as you say, you know, black folks, have, you know, there's no, there's no denial of the imagination that's in it, its droves, but actually the, there's the infrastructure that's missing. I've been reading, um, uh, uh, oh gosh, race from technology and algorithms of oppression and these extraordinary texts. And it feels like you're really, you're shifting this from simply, I mean, I'm saying simply theory, like it, it's not simple theory, but theory into applied practice with experimentation and it's blowing my mind. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like, I think, for, thank you so much for all of that. I think that for me, um, like, honestly, like this, like this, this sort of like new um, realm of like the work that I'm doing, um, I, I guess what I've just been trying to do um, since I actually just started, I, I started making art in general was just sort of like, connect like what does it mean to connect all of these different fields like into one um because like I feel like for me I sort of weave through a lot of different like communities like I weave through a lot of different like movement communities a lot of different like applied tech communities and then yes like you know theoretical like theory communities and it's like okay like we all need to like talk to each other <laughs> and work together so that we can actually like you know begin to um build and um also not even just build but rediscover reestablish our connections to um those ancestral and spiritual technologies that already exist um so that we can um really just like recognize the power also like within those uh technologies um so yeah can I'm we like, talk about antidote because <laughs> I just want to watch it again. Can we talk about antidote because one in and of itself, what a gorgeous piece of work! Like, and and I can imagine how powerful that as an experience must have been. But like, as a, it feels like as a wholly collaborative thing. What you're talking about is connection, not just with um, with each other, but connection to an ancestral um, relationship, an ancestral experience. How do you how do you begin something like that? Like like how do you come to that work? How do other people come to that work? And then how do you find each other to 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 make a thing like that? Yeah. So honestly, um, for me personally, I'm like at the beginning of my spiritual journey and like even like my ancestral journey. Um, and so, um, but I would say that it started like maybe like two years ago, like very just like, well, well, my whole life, but 
um, two years ago, I started actually like diving in a little bit deeper, like building ancestor altar, um, talking to them, and um, and now they they have pretty much said, "Hey, we finna be in your work." <laughs> <laughs> okay like you know and I just listen so like for me I'm just like I'm someone who just likes to listen and um the more that I listen and, and this is what I've learned the more that I listen um to them um the more blessings appear in my life and um just seeing that beautiful relationship like for me grow with them has been just like so amazing um right after I did the first black movement performance um, I actually reached out to um, Deneen Richburg, who is um, the uh, founder of Brown Body. And um, Brown Body is an all African American figure skating company um, based in Minnesota. And what's so beautiful about them and about this company is that we take this work, this work of re establishing our connections to our ancestors. Um, decommodifying our bodies, um, taking out, like trying to like um, really like um, pinpoint um, all of this like internalized anti-blackness in our bodies so that we can heal. Um, because like we all grew up figure skating and figure skating is like a super white sport. It's one of those sports that um, even uh, like we're already indoctrinated into um, all of these different systems of oppression. But like when you are also doing these, like when you're um, involved in like white sports and white spaces and all of these things, you get even super, <laughs> even more indoctrinated than um, <laughs> I guess like what's normal. So um, what does it mean to sort of like take, like, you know, take that apart um, and unravel that? So we do a lot of like ancestor work and um, we did ring shout on the ice. And that experience for me was just like so, um, it was just so like mind blowing. And I realized then that I needed to, that I needed to like participate in the movement as well. That I wasn't just like, you know, a capture of, of other performers movements, but that I also was a participant in this space too. And I needed to do the work of, of decolonizing my body of, of um, really diving into these relationships. So with Antidote, um, it just like, honestly, it just became what it was. Like, honestly, like when I tell you that, like we were working on a, a, some, we were working outside of time, first of all, like we got so much done. We got 20 minutes of animation <laughs> done, um, like in a really, really short period of time. And what I realized was it wasn't just me doing the animating because yeah, like I, I created the visuals, but I realized I was like, there's no way that like I, <laughs> I myself <laughs> created 20 minutes of visuals <laughs> in like three weeks. Like that don't make no sense. <laughs> so I'm just like, <laughs> so I'm just like, oh, like, no, my ancestors were with me, like holding me, holding my hand through this experience. They were like, no, we got to get this done. <laughs> like they be. And I was just like, okay, like I got you. So um, yeah, we did a lot of different movement exercises with Marguerite. Like we would do like witnessing and, you know, like we would just try to bring up movements that we felt connected to them that brought them into the space. Um, and from there, it was like, it no longer even really became like this sort of communication through Zoom. Like we were just like, we were connecting on some other like level. So, um, and, I, and I also feel like the visuals as well, um, they, they manifested from that, from that feeling of, con of real true connection um, and so, and then just like bringing on all of these just amazing, brilliant, um, black films. I was just like, yes, like, <laughs> I was just like, ah, like, I, I was just like, I was, every time we asked someone and they were just like, yeah. And I was just like, what? Like, I was so hyped to just work with all these people. <laughs> and I just felt like we collectively just like went off. Like we just collectively were just like, yes, we're going to heal. And then I realized, oh my gosh, like my job is to like heal period. Like, you know, I, 
I get paid to heal and I make art and like that is just amazing like that is just wild to me you yeah know, you know maybe maybe my ancestors are here maybe all of our ancestors are here right now because they feel that there's such a powerful alignment that there's a, like the, the Maya team have been on a journey right and I'm sure lots of people have been on a journey and what feels really important to me I was in a conversation last week um, and we were we were speaking about race and connection to land and land justice um, and um, shared assets are an organization who are doing a lot of work around narratives a lot of really important work um, and we were talking a lot about frameworks and law and policy and um, there were a group of us um, black women and black femmes who were in a in a separate group chat like in a breakout room and one of the things that kept coming up is there's always this omission of spirituality, this like deeper spiritual thing that maybe we don't always have the vocabulary for, but it's so present. It's, it manifests itself in our practice, in our work, in our thinking, in our bodies, whether we know it or whether we don't. And I'm just obsessed with the idea that, that, you, that you know it, that you feel it, that you're, you're accessing it to actually make work. How glorious. I just feel just like so grateful. Like, it's like, it's so weird. Like, um, like I feel like so full and I know that whenever I feel like I, I used to feel very like lonely in a lot of ways. Um, but once I started doing this type, doing work in this specific way, like that loneliness just like faded away um mainly because I know I'm not alone like it's so weird and I'm just like what <laughs> and like yeah and then I just see like I just see how it manifests in my life like I see like just so many blessings just like open themselves up to me and I'm just like what like this is such a beautiful <laughs> way to live and I just like want to share that with so I just want to share that with everyone because I'm just like I feel like everyone needs to sort of like tap in because I feel like we're living in like a society in a world that tells you that you are not allowed to do that <laughs> and that if you do do that you're going to get shunned and you're not going to like you're not going to be able to live and um and I know that for a fact it's not true um because I see it like I can see visual like I can visually see it um and I feel it so um being able to sort of like what I'm, I guess I'm trying to do is I'm trying to stay on that level like all the time like because there's sometimes when um you sort of like fall you fall because because you know there's so many things like coming at us from all these different um spaces especially now and it's like <laughs> how am I going to like continue this um, reestablishing of this connection. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a journey, but it's, it's, it's so worth it. I'll say, <laughs> I am, I'm really conscious of time and I'm, I'm heartbroken because I want to, I want to keep going. You, you, you've, you've, you know, you planted this seed <laughs> and, and um, yeah, it's just been an honor to, to have you with us. Like, what a wow. Um, everyone, thank you so much for, for being with us. Lajene, that is just incredible. Your work is so phenomenal. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, we've got a couple of polls before we end. If anyone needs to rush off quickly, um, please feel free. So I think the poll is going to pop up any second now. Um, and very simple. It'll take you like a couple of seconds to respond. Um, have they popped up? Oh, we don't. We don't. <laughs> we don't have any polls. <laughs> Ignore that. <laughs> um, so basically, we we just want to know, like, put it in the chat if this conversation has been inspiring in any way, has encouraged you to think about space and place and movement in a different way. Um, just let us know. Engage with us on on socials. TSI twenty twenty one. Follow Lajene. I think Lajene, you put your Instagram up in the chat. A bit earlier so follow Lajene. I know you're gonna already like I don't even have to say because you know why wouldn't you um thank you so much for everyone that's been with us from this morning thank you if you've just joined us for this session this evening or morning or afternoon depending on where you are in the world 
And again, Lajane, thank you so much for rounding off the first day of the spatial imagination with a bang and a half. I mean, my goodness. <laughs> thank Yay, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and also, we have to get you to Birmingham like as soon as flights and safety and all of this, like you already know. Yes. Yes. Come and stay for like a month or something. I don't know. I don't care. Seriously, just I just want to. <laughs> I need. Mean, I can't wait to like be around people again and like definitely visit y'all. Like y'all are so cool. Um, thank you for having me. <laughs> Anytime. If I could, I'd be like, see you tomorrow, Bab. But <laughs> whenever we can get you here, we will. Thank you so much, and thank you, everybody. Take care. Enjoy your evening. Please rest well. Stay hydrated, drop your shoulders. Thank you, Jabez. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. What an honor. Wow. Thank you.